There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to Interverse. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host on this audio journey where we are recording on the 3rd of May, 2020, just a few days after Beltane, as we follow in the footsteps of our ancestors and continue the ageless May Day tradition, making some form of contact with the spiritual intelligence on the other side of the veil. Well, maybe not direct experiential contact, but podcasting has always been a vicarious act. And today, our link to the Enchanted Land should be a plenty powerful one, at least, thanks to our returning guest, the splendidly spectacular scholar and adaptable archetypal astrologer, Becca Tarnas. It wasn't long ago that Becca first came on the show back in early March, but with how things have developed since then, it seems like that Enchanted conversation happened a long time ago in a galaxy far away. And since that first chat, I have been impatiently waiting for a second round because it was a truly terrific episode that you'll probably want to make sure you've heard before diving into this one although it probably won't be required. In our initial meeting, Becca and I discussed her book, Journey to the Imaginal Realm, along with an innumerable host of related Tolkienian subjects, including the cosmological mythos underlying the Lord of the Rings, the nature of the imagination and what Tolkien's work can teach us about the creative process, the Atlantis angle as it appears in various Tolkien works, the parallels between Carl Jung and J.R.R., and that was just in the first hour. It was definitely one of my favorite episodes of all time. And lucky for me, when it comes to talking about the infinite wisdom you can find in Middle Earth and the related works, it seems that the road goes ever on and on. This time around, we're going to look more closely at Western civilization's long history of fairy stories through the lens of Tolkien's analysis and narrative contributions to the canon, as well as how a variety of plot points and themes of the Lord of the Rings trilogy relate to this bigger picture of our interconnection to blessed realms of fairies and elves. Although the phrase fairy tale has a modern connotation that causes most people to classify anything of the sort as being for children, in truth, this topic may have more to do with things like alien contact and spiritual interference than with simple nursery rhymes. For all we know, there may be many seeds of truth planted in the countless tales of the perilous realm that Tolkien was so enamored by, and the elves themselves could be anything from otherworldly to ascended spiritual masters from this one. In his essay on fairy stories, Tolkien says that the realm of the fairy story is wide and deep and high and filled with many things. All manner of beasts and birds are found there, shoreless seas and stars uncounted, beauty that is an enchantment and an ever-present peril both joy and sorrow, as sharp as swords. In that realm, a man may perhaps count himself fortunate to have wandered, but its very richness and strangeness tie the tongue of a traveler who would report them. And while he is there, it is dangerous for him to ask too many questions, lest the gates be shut and the keys lost. But don't worry, guys, we're only taking this journey in our minds, so most likely we won't encounter any dangers or get hopelessly lost along the way, although for a chance to visit elvish lands, I for one would take the risk of dragons. This show should follow up nicely from last week's interview with David Whitehead, where we spent a lot of time examining Tolkien's trilogy as a guiding myth for our time, with a strong emphasis on what it means to be heroic in a world with no dragons to slay, but plenty of insidious evil to resist. And the best part is that I didn't plan to do two Tolkien episodes in a row, but as chance would have it, (laughs) things just worked out that way. As I said the first time around with Becca, The Lord of the Rings is not just a story, it's a rite of passage. And if you haven't taken that journey with the original books, consider spending what is hopefully the last few weeks or days of your quarantine life diving into one of the greatest mystical experiences available in our modern age. Even if you've seen the movies, the books are on another level, high and above just about anything out there. And thanks to YouTube, you can even listen to them in dramatized audiobook form if the tome seems too thick for you. And if you do decide to take a trip into that amazing story thanks to this episode, consider pairing your adventure with Becca's excellent guide, Journey to the Imaginal Realm, to really enhance your experience and understanding of the epicness. Check the show notes for links to beccatarnas.com, her book, and the link to subscribe to Interverse Plus at patreon.com forward slash Interverse, where you can get the extended edition of this show and the archive of great and ageless content from the last years of the podcast. And if you're a fan of the LOTR movies, you know the extended version is the only way to go. Am I right? 
Now let's open up those third eyes and ears and get this show on the road with our returning guest, the top Tolkien decoder and fantastic fairy realm factotum, the one and only Becca Tarnas. Thank you for joining us again, Becca, and welcome back to Interverse. Thank you so much for having me back. That was a great introduction. You're quite a, uh, a wordsmith there. Well, I majored in creative writing and the only way I really apply it is a podcast introduction spot, but it's a useful skill actually to be able to uh, understand the symbolism and things from an experiential level of having worked with it because it starts to open up the entire world around us as being as interpretable as a dream, despite the fact that it's a consensual waking reality. Absolutely. I loved your play on words as chance would have it. And even before we started speaking, I was thinking about your name and the significance of the word chance in Tolkien and how he never uses the word chance by accident. He never uses it lightly. It always points toward something deeper, toward a sense of destiny or the divine or synchronicity that chance isn't just happenstance. So that your name itself is is a metonymic. It has a, a mythic quality to it that's perfectly fit into Tolkien's cosmos. Yeah, I actually had a line in my notes about that to see what you thought of that. And it does seem obvious to, to the reader that it's never chance whenever it's said to be so. It's always the synchronicity of de of destiny or fate or what I like to think of as the the music of the Einar in a way. It's a... Uh, they're just marching along to the beat of the cosmic vision of creation of which they're just an instrument. Yeah. The equivalence of, of chance to the music of creation is that's a really clear and uh, beautiful way of putting it. I think that that's definitely something that Tolkien is pointing toward is chance actually fate. Is it the intervention of the divine? I love how sometimes Gandalf will say, you know, it's a, a chance meeting, as we say in Middle Earth. <laughs> as we say in Middle Earth, where the veil keeps us from fully seeing the uh, the divine drama as it was originally intended. I guess we have to be in those waters of forgetfulness to make the experience both exciting and one that we can learn from. Because if we knew the ending, if Sam and Frodo knew the ending before they set off on their journey, they probably still would have gone. but would they have had the same level of courage? It's hard to know. I mean, when faced with adversity, if they had known that they're supposed to succeed and that they're destined to succeed, would they have felt defeated by the adversity as opposed to just doing the right thing as they did every step along the way, despite how impossible it seemed? And definitely as a tool for growth, not knowing is actually really important, I think. And that's a big part of the fairy story itself, I believe. I, I wanted to start off talking about on fairy stories, the the journey into the unknown or the perilous realm. Uh, I've got a lot of passages that I snipped out from Tolkien's essay of the same name, which I recommend listeners go check out because even if you're not interested in fairy tales per se, it's a really amazing examination into like the nature of the imagination and the creative process and a very useful perspective on the world itself. But to start off by kind of defining what we mean when we're talking about fairy stories and how that's not the same as Mother Goose, to quote Tolkien, he says, supernatural is a dangerous and difficult word in any of its senses, looser or stricter, but to fairies, it can hardly be applied unless super is taken merely as a superlative prefix for it is man who in contrast to fairies is supernatural and often of diminutive stature, <laughs> whereas they are natural, far more natural than he. And then later on, he continues to say, the definition of a fairy story, what it is or what it should be, does not then depend on any definition or historical account of elf or fairy, but upon the nature of fairy, the perilous realm itself, and the air that blows in that country. I will not attempt to define that, nor to describe it directly. It cannot be done. That's not good for us. <laughs> he says, fairy cannot be caught in a net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. It has many ingredients, but analysis will not necessarily discover the secret of the whole. So <laughs> what do you think of this? And, uh, you know, the difference, some of the uh, differences beyond what I quoted here that Tolkien brings out between 
what he considers fairy stories and things like traditional polymorphized animal myths or those type of cultural stories that are not exactly the same as what he's talking about. Well, there are two things that really stand out to me from that passage. First, in the definition of fairies and elves as natural rather than supernatural, there's a not so hidden ecological ethic in that. The recognition that what we call now from our more modern disenchanted perspective, what we call just imaginary or just made up, that Tolkien is saying, no, that is more natural than we are. Because we as human beings imagine ourselves to be separate from the natural world. That is not something that an elf or a fairy would ever conceive of. They are of the natural world. And if you go to places where there is still that embedded sense of a fairy and quality in the natural world, you, you realize that, oh, this is truly a feature of the landscape. This isn't something that we are somehow superimposing on it. Or you could think of it as the, the interplay of the human imagination with the landscape, something again, rising in between. And a, a place I'm thinking of that's like that, that I felt very drawn to visit for this very reason is Iceland. Iceland is a place where, you know, they say about 5% of the population believes very strongly in elves and fairies, the huldefolk, as they call them, the hidden folk. And 5% of the population absolutely agrees that, you know, fairies and elves and so forth don't exist. And so that leaves us with about 90% of the population. They're like, they could exist. They might not exist. I don't know. Um, but there's space for it. And the way that that belief or recognition shows up culturally is a respect for the landscape, a respect for the places that are considered to be the homes of the hidden people. So a road may be built not conveniently in a straight line, but curving around a particular set of rocks that somebody who is part of that 5% who knows that the whole folk are there say, no, 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 we can't build here. That's why your machinery keeps breaking down. That's why you are having accidents every time you try and bulldoze these rocks. This is the home of some elves. So they build around it. And that cultural recognition of the ecological significance of the fairy folk is it's extraordinary. And that is, I think, part of the, the ethic that's encapsulated in, in a fairy story, what we've inherited of that kind of worldview, you would say. And a fairy story arises from a particular moment in cultural history. And I was thinking about this actually in the context of the line that we get in The Fellowship of the Ring, the film version only, interestingly, spoken in Galadriel's voice where she says, it's right at the beginning in the prologue. She says, history became legend, legend became myth. And I, the last time I watched the film and I heard those lines, I realized that is an inverse of the evolution of consciousness. You go from myth to legend to history, and you can see a similar thing in the Western tradition, at least, where you, we now would say, you know, that when we, we tell our story, it's history. But you go back a certain amount of time, and, and that's where we see fairy tales emerging, and particularly coming out of the 18th, 17th, 16th centuries. Fairy stories come out of a time where there's that ambiguity about what is real and what is it isn't. The worldview is being disenchanted when fairy stories are 
being written. And but what comes before the fairy story, that's the legend. And we we look back there, you know, think of, for example, the Arthurian legends, where they're this beautiful, confusing intersection of is it history? Was King Arthur a real person? Is it a myth of some kind? Clearly, there's an element of fairy here, but there's also Christianity, which brings in the element of religion and history, because that's a very historically situated religion. So all these confusing intersections, and that's where we get something like legend. And then you go back even further, and that's when we start tapping in to myth. And myth is when none of this has been separated out. When there's no ambiguity around what is real and what isn't, rather the the landscape itself, the culture itself brings forward the, the stories of deities, of gods, of archetypal figures. And it doesn't matter if they're outside of us as gods in the natural world, or they are arising within us as what we would now consider, you know, psychological archetypes or psychological complexes. It's only now that we separate all those things out. Myth comes from a time when they're all unified. So we can trace that evolution from myth into legend, into fairy story. And then finally, maybe arriving at the fantasy novel, where it's very clear that the separation has been made. No one's wondering about Tolkien's story of Middle Earth um, when he's publishing it in the mid-1950s. Oh, is this a historical record? I mean, now in conversations that we're having, we blast open a whole new category of questions when we wonder, well, is this a record of an imaginal experience, of a visionary experience that's been shaped into art? So with fairy stories, coming back to Tolkien's great essay and what you brought forward, fairy stories themselves emerge from that ambiguous time where we haven't determined what is historical fact, what is arising from the human imagination questioning what is the human imagination? Is that in itself a, an ecological or a cosmological fact? Is the human imagination natural? And I think that's in itself what Tolkien is pointing toward when he says fairies and elves are natural because the imagination itself is a natural feature of this cosmos. Very, very interesting. I like the line where he says the <laughs> about the air that blows in that country being part of what makes it fairy. And it makes me think of how our ancestors in that mythic mode of consciousness, where there is no separation would have to have found significance in every gust of wind at every moment, they would be paying attention to even just the little breeze and how it may have seemed a reaction to something that they merely thought. And uh, you could even say that when you're talking about the stories of the gods presenting themselves to our ancestors out of the very landscape itself, it's as if they were in a mode of consciousness where instead of trying to use imagination to, or use reason, I guess is probably more what it is, use reason to try and uh, force meaning onto things, they just experienced the significance of nature as it was without without that sort of tinkering of reason and logic being applied to it to come to a conclusion of separation ultimately i mean as we move from mythic to legend to history so there's there's definitely something there <laughs> it's just as tolkien says it's so hard to actually you basically can't describe it directly and in that sense it is a um, fairy is a stand-in for the infinite itself or God itself. Like I'm sure Tolkien had deep thoughts about this, but maybe was more reserved in some ways because of his uh, faith and because of his audience at that time from going as far as what he probably felt inside whenever he was in this fairy state or in these uh, visionary places that he, it seems that he was able to, to visit quite 
literally, at least for himself, the, the imaginal realm, if you will, which uh, if we take the understanding of the universe to be true, that all is mind and that all is imagination and everything are, that arises out of reality is a form of the imagining of a, a creator, if you will. If if we do have that understanding of the universe as being purely mental, then the things of the imagination or the imaginal realm that Tolkien was visiting is and it, it is as true as anything else. And there's no distinction between the experience of say dreaming and waking and that's where this stuff all exists is in that in between of the two liminal sides uh, <laughs> but to go back to uh, some more tolkien quoting i wanted to bring up the philology thing again we talked about this a little bit last time and a, a lot whenever it comes to the whole idea of sub creation and creation i thought that that was a beautiful explanation you gave us of that entire concept but Tolkien says about philology, philology has, which is the study of language for anyone's wondering, philology has been dethroned from the high place it once held in this court of inquiry. Max Mueller's view of mythology as a disease of language can be abandoned without regret. Mythology is not a disease at all, though it may, like all human things, become diseased. You might as well say that thinking is a disease of the mind. It would be more near the truth to say that languages, especially modern European languages, are a disease of mythology. But language cannot all the same be dismissed. The incarnate mind, the tongue, and the tail are in our world coeval. The human mind, endowed with the powers of generalization and abstraction, sees not only green grass, discriminating it from other things and finding it fair to look upon, but sees that it is green as well as being grass. But how powerful, how stimulating to the very faculty that produced it was the invention of the adjective. No spell or incantation in fairy is more potent. <laughs> so... He says a lot more here, but I think, I mean, I'll get your thoughts for sure. I'm, I, I hope you can help clarify this for me. But I think part of what he's saying is that what makes this fantasy or this fairy, it, the way that f language is involved is in this concept of abstraction and generalization and the adjective. Because w when I say that grass is green and someone might ima have a picture of that in their mind, the shade of green could be across an incredible spectrum of hues. I remember one of the first times I really woke up to nature for myself. It, at that time, I looked around and saw all the grass and all the trees and all the bushes around me and realized I've been looking at this as just green. Like I was looking at the world through only the language, like saying, this is, that's all green. It's all, I'm not look. I'm not noticing it for real. And in that moment, I noticed what was around me. And I saw that this green is not this green is not this green. It's all it's all in its own way unique and has a powerful impact upon the perceiver if they're actually looking past what they've labeled it as, I guess. <laughs> what, what do you think about, about this spell weaving that we do with our, our words? Well, language was something that was deeply important to Tolkien and, and to all the Inklings, uh, the Oxford Inklings, that he, that literary group that he was a part of that included C.S. Lewis and, and Owen Barfield and come back to, to Barfield in a moment because his philosophy is really key in some ways to understanding this and to understanding Tolkien's perspective as well. What Tolkien is saying with the power of the adjective and that that is a spell. And there's no mistake that the word spell, when referring to magic, is spell, as in spelling, as in grammar. Grammar itself is a word that comes from glamour, which is a reference to the kind of enchanted quality that, that language has. And so when he's talking about the power of the adjective, and our capacity to recognize not only the grass, but that it's green, we can, in the magic of our language and imagination, take that green of the grass and apply it to something else. And the example that he gives in On Fairy Stories is applying that to the sun. We can say the green sun. My goodness, the power of language that we can say the green sun. But the true act of enchantment isn't just 
kind of willy nilly applying adjectives wherever you would like and having a red sky or a purple river or silver skinned people or something like that. It's perceiving a world that is internally consistent with that green sun. And if you can do that, that is truly enchantment. It is entering into a secondary world. And that is what fantasy is striving for from Tolkien's perspective. And the reason that you can't just arbitrarily reassign the adjective, what makes something internally consistent is that Tolkien was the kind of person who you could say he took language seriously. He wasn't a nominalist. He wasn't someone who saw language as an arbitrary label for things. Rather, he saw words as inherently carrying their meaning. And that the words that we use in all the variety of languages around the world have an innate connection to what it is that they are not just describing, but evoking. And this is where I want to bring Owen Barfield in. Are you familiar at all with with Barfield's work, such as um, Poetic Diction or Saving the Appearances? I have not read Barfield, but people that I read say to read Barfield. So I'm sure he's going to be on the list. And uh, just to toss in my two cents before you continue about Barfield, I think it's really becoming clear to me in, in this analysis how what he means by modern European language is being a disease of mythology in that so many of our words are in many cases, the opposite of what they mean in the mythological sense or to the, the right brain, if you will, the, uh, the deep, deeper etymological underpinnings of words. And there's a lot in our language more now than in Tolkien's time that has become uh, nonsense. Whenever looked at through the lens of actual strict grammar and philology and the, the uh that type of a study so i think it's definitely it's something we've talked about on the show in the past how that in, impacts our our civilization's level of consciousness and the baseline that most people are at exactly that language is so connected to consciousness for example if you grow up only speaking one language you are going to have your consciousness shaped by that one language But if you grow up bilingual, then your consciousness will be shaped by the deep history of both of those languages, and you will switch forms of consciousness depending which language you are speaking. And one can experience this in really profound ways. You know, for example, I went to a Waldorf school, and in in Waldorf, they at least the school I went to, one of the languages that you grow up learning is German. And the German language has a grammatical structure that in some ways feels very mathematical. You have to have, especially if you're speaking in the past tense, you have to have a good understanding of where you're going in your sentence because you have split your verb in half. You have half of the verb at the beginning near your subject, and then the other half is at the end. So you need to, in your conscious awareness, know where your sentence is going to end before you even begin it. It's very different than a kind of stream of consciousness form of speaking where you can begin a sentence but have no idea where you're going to trail off to. Now, in German, they have two different kinds of past tense. One has this more mathematical structure that's quite logical. And the other is a narrative past tense where you do conjugate the verb right at the beginning, but they only reserve that past tense for telling stories. And that's significant. So in itself, those are two different forms of consciousness within one language. Now extrapolate that out to all the different kinds of languages that are in the world And now we have as many kinds of consciousness as there are language or as many kinds of consciousness as there uh, are dialects. Even this idea is explored really beautifully in the film Arrival with Amy Adams. If you've seen that, I highly recommend that. And that 
opens up an understanding of how language, consciousness, and time are deeply interconnected. But from this perspective, and it's it's one that Tolkien really looked through, words, language, they're fossils. And this is what etymology shows us. And philology, which was his professional field of study, and philology translates as love of language. You have philos, love, logos, language, or the word, love of the word. And my goodness, if that doesn't sum Tolkien up perfectly, he wasn't a linguist, he was a philologist. And he traced words back through their etymology to see their changing meanings through time. And what he pointed out that shows us is that as the word evolves, it's not just that we're changing how we say something. The word is evolving because our consciousness is evolving with it. And that if you revive a dead language, such as Gothic, which is something that he did, you can actually, through that, step back into the culture that was lost alongside the language. And this is something that Owen Barfield, uh, one of the Oxford Inklings, who was very interested in the evolution of consciousness and uh, was influenced by Rudolf Steiner, among other people, he explored this very deeply also through language, more from a philosophical perspective. And I highly recommend his work, especially those two books I mentioned, uh, Saving the Appearances, which is kind of the, the great flower of everything he wrote. And then what I would say is the seed of that book that he wrote 30 years earlier, one Saturn cycle earlier, Poetic Diction. And Poetic Diction is my personal favorite of Barfield's works because he uses poetry to trace that evolution of the meaning of words. And one example he gives, and I think that this connects to a lot of the different things that, that you've been bringing forward in these quotes from on fairy stories. He talks about the word spiritus in Latin and how now we translate that word spiritus in at least into three other words. It's spirit, but it's also wind. And it's also breath. And what Barfield's point is, is that for the original speaker of that word, they're not seeing this as something that can mean breath or spirit or wind and applying it in their poetry in a metaphorical way. Rather, for the original speaker of that word, Spiritus means all of those things at once, and it evokes the spirit of the wind and the breath within us all at once. It means all of those things at once because the physical and the ensouled or the spiritual are unified to that form of consciousness. And you can trace that in the word. The word itself is a fossil of that kind of consciousness. It's only now as we speak about it that they're split and the wind is something that's separate from the spirit, which is separate from the breath within us that not only do we breathe, but that gives us life. And if we see that as one concept and then apply it to that beautiful quote you brought forward about the air of fairy, the air of fairy is an air where you experience the wind blowing and you know that that is the spirit. And that is the power of language that people like Tolkien and Barfield are pointing towards. Very powerful too. And the ramifications just, I mean, that's the perfect example because if we are in our modern age, seeing wind and breath and spirit as being different doesn't that allow for humanity or maybe even influence humanity to see the earth as a non-living and non-spiritual entity, which is likely going to make it that much easier to then despoil it and, you know, turn everything into Mordor. So, and then we'll probably get to that as well. Some of the uh, things Tolkien would have had to say about technology of our modern time, because that does come up in the escape section of his essay, but I will I will talk more about the kingdom of fairy for now and bring up this idea that 
he who would enter into the kingdom should have the heart of a little child. And as that you are an archetypal astrologer and a you know deep Jungian archetypal expert, if you will, the concept of the inner child and what's happening to that archetype in the collective consciousness today, right now, I think that is important to discuss and why this self-murdered part of most people, because that part of them is closed off, they might not be able to even conceive of entering into fairy or know that that's a place they can go. It's like, it's like uh, keep being kept in your cell of your, the cell of your physical body and your immediate external reality without any escape as Tolkien puts it. That idea of the inner child is I think another example of the split within us. We split adults, disenchanted adults from children who are the ones who were given the fairy stories. And that the idea of the inner child is within the adult is actually a recognition of that state of consciousness that is one that views the world through new eyes, through wonder. That is the state of consciousness that we intentionally go into when, for example, we alter our consciousness through psychedelics, through sacred medicine. It is coming back into that inner child consciousness within us and looking through those fresh eyes. And that's something that Tolkien speaks to as well and on fairy stories, that what a fairy story offers us is a fresh view on the world. It's like cleaning the windows, he describes. And that we can be able to gain a new view on the familiar, on the everyday, by stepping back into that childlike place of wonder. And by reclaiming the childlike, maybe here just in, in the same way that I like to make a difference between the imaginary and the imaginal, where the imaginary is what's made up and the imaginal is that form of perception that comes through the imagination of something real or something true. Maybe we should also differentiate childlike from childish. And that childlike being that state of wonder, that fresh form of seeing or that fresh form of consciousness, you know, think of, for example, the title of uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind, that it's the beginner's mind that allows us to enter into practice in that way, meditative practice. And to be childlike is to have that beginner's mind versus being childish, which is something that I think far too many adults actually cling to. How many people in our current culture are really just grown up children who have simultaneously lost their state of childlike wonder, but also haven't been initiated into adulthood either. And I think that the, the key in some ways to that initiation is becoming the, the true adult to that childlike state of wonder within us, that inner child who's always being reborn, who's always looking at the world through fresh eyes. And to be an adult is to protect that part of ourselves. So we have to be strong in our adult selves to really be able to show up for that inner child. And we can't really do that if we haven't initiated that part of ourselves to, to take care of that state of wonder. So those are, I guess, some, some di differentiations of language that I wanted to use because uh, it's so easy to just like we relegate and throw out, you know, just um, it's just imaginary. We also throw out, Oh, that's, that's just childish. And to be able to find that, what's really worth reclaiming and protecting not only in actual children and you know how we raise our children in this world but also protecting that within ourselves as adults 
Wow, this is really interesting because it actually ties back into what I was talking about with the when I saw green as green instead of uh, just the mental concept or the language, uh, the language label of green. And I, th- I think what I like to call that state that you're describing of being uninitiated into the mystery and actually suppressing the inner child and the, the sense of wonder and awe, that's like adultism instead of actual, or, and like maybe you could call the person who is the initiate, the, the adept as opposed to the adult, but the grown up adept protects the sense of wonder in themselves and keeps it, keeps that flame or that spark alive and preserved. I think there's a lot of interesting representation of that in the Lord of the Rings. I mean, Gandalf is the ultimate adept. Of course, he does the protecting of many realms and peoples, particularly the Shire, where things are in a state of primeval innocence and they take enjoyment out of the little things that fallen man has actually left behind and the beauty of the connection with nature as traded for technology or, or power. So another character that is a good representation of that might be Aragorn as well. He protects the, the young hobbits throughout the story in many ways and is in is self-sacrificing to help Frodo complete the quest. And to talk about Frodo, he actually loses this childlike state despite the destruction of the ring. And I think that's a really interesting consequence of the, the events that unfold in the story is how Frodo at the end, even after they've returned, he's still bothered or plagued by the trauma of what he's experienced in the, the reality of evil as it exists in himself because he now knows it to be a fact. And so that's why he has to go on his journey to the blessed realm with Gandalf and the other ring bearers because the Shire was saved, but not saved for him. It was saved for the others. And I think this is a really important dynamic that we should all be striving to be aware of in ourselves. Are we being adepts or are we adult in a state of adultism? Right. Absolutely. And I also feel like that in itself is a practice and that, I mean, I'll speak from very personal experience here that uh, we can strive toward being in that place of an adult taking care of that inner child. And that is an everyday practice. And it is very easy to fall out of that space. So when I'm talking about this too, I, I don't think that it's, you know, there's this moment of initiation and then you are an adept from here on out. It is something that, uh, you know, in the same way that we have to continue working out our bodies to stay in shape, we have to continue working out our capacity to be an adult and take care of our inner childlike state of wonder. And examples like Gandalf or like Aragorn are really wonderful because there's something in them that I'm I'm thinking particularly of contrasting Gandalf with Saruman here. Saruman would probably see himself very much as, you know, the grown up in the room. He's the, the head of the white council. He is the white wizard. He's the highest of the order of the Astari. He wouldn't deign to go into the Shire and find out about the culture of these little earth loving hobbits. He wouldn't sit down and enjoy ale with them and eat their food and smoke their pipe weed for goodness sake. No, that's very much beneath him, but it isn't beneath Gandalf. And I think that is Gandalf tending to that part of himself. And that is the great difference between them. And it's why Gandalf is able to succeed the only one of the Astari sent to Middle Earth to help the people of Middle Earth. He's the only one of those five to succeed because he is humble enough. He has the humility to be able to connect with, with the little people to connect with the people who are closest to the earth. And there's something I was uh, speaking with someone the other day about the root of that word 
uh, humility coming from humus, the, the rich layer of soil that is, uh, you know, what gives nutrients to the earth. We can grow plants and grow our food in, and that that too is the root of being human. And so that humility, humanity, that closeness to the humus, the earth, that is what gives Gandalf all the gifts that he needs to be able to see his own quest through to the end uh, and how different that is from Saruman who just sees the Shire as something to exploit as look at this rich country that we can industrialize and capitalize and sell off and doesn't that sound like the powers that be in the world that we find ourselves in right now it definitely does and Another aspect of that character, Saruman, uh, especially in contrast to Gandalf, is this idea of being the logical one. Like that's uh, something that's attributed to being the grown up in the room or <laughs> to this adultism thing. Not that logic and reason aren't useful. They're actually part of the toolkit at all times. They should be, but in their place and balance with the other aspects of our consciousness in this greater soup of imagination and all its forms. And so we, we talked about this with David last week, but I'll bring it up again because I think it's such an important point is that you, you're misusing this faculty of logic or reason when you become so fearful that there's no other choice to be had in a situation that you need to do something evil or shady in order to attempt to control the outcome. And that's definitely what led Saruman down the path. At first, he was just studying Sauron's ways. And then before long, he felt that it was inevitable that Sauron would take over. So the only way to prevent that would, or to prevent his own destruction or to lessen the impact, it became a slippery slope for him of, well, first I'm going to start using some of the tools that he's created, this industrialization and these orcs in order to rival his power. And but before long, he's just a servant of it. He's just a servant. If you use evil, if you try to use evil to, as a means that are justified because you think that's for good ends, then you've already been taken over by evil. Evil's already won, of course. And the difference there between him and Gandalf is that Gandalf, although he's plenty logical and has the faculty of reason to no end, he also is able to, even when things seem hopeless, to trust in the courage of others and trust in <laughs> chance, as we put it, that if the, if you the, only a fool's hope, he says, but as long as there is some glimmer of hope, he's never, and there always will be, he's never going to sell out, if you will. He's, he's going to resist the evil to even his own, seemingly to his own destruction, despite the fact that uh, he was l luckily, luckily for everyone, he was able to come back <laughs> after that fight with the Balrog. But it, this is really interesting stuff. And I also think that on the subject of the childlike part of ourself, I believe that when Tolkien is in his on fairy stories essay describing recovery, the recovery process that uh, one can receive from fairy stories is, do you think that's what he means by recovery that entering into this imaginal realm through these types of narratives is a way of nurturing that childlike side of the self? I do. I feel like it's a, an opening back out into that, that enchanted form of consciousness. And he has the discussion of recovery alongside that of escape. And that one of the things that fantasy stories fairy tales often get accused of are being escapist and that literary critics you know throw this word around as really quite a negative negative. and tolkien makes this differentiation between he says the escape of the prisoner and the flight of the deserter and he says that if you were to if if you were to find yourself in jail who would blame you for wanting to, to escape and go home. And that just because one is imprisoned doesn't mean that the world outside the walls of the prison is no less real or that it's not there. 
And I realize that what he's saying by that, that what fairy stories offer us in escape from the world of the prison is that the real world on the outside of those prison walls, that is the enchanted realm, but not a separated off enchanted realm. There's another part in that same essay on fairy stories where he says, the land of fairy is our world. And he describes all these things that are in it. It contains the sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, the forests. Yes, it also contains elves and fays and dragons and witches. But, and the most important thing is he says, and it contains us, mortal human beings, when we are enchanted. And it's that turn when you realize that he's saying, oh, fairy is this world, this earth and he's so clear middle earth is our earth not some other planet it's not some out there it's right here you just have to be enchanted to see it and that is what the recovery is it's a recovery of our birthright of being enchanted beings because that enchantment is a part of the rest of the cosmos There are plenty of things that point toward it. The fact that divination works, the fact that astrology works. There are many, many clear signs that point toward the fantasy world really is our world. We're just in a phase in history and a state of consciousness, at least within the the culture you and I are speaking within, where those have been separated out. And our task right now is to figure out how do we bridge between those worlds? How do we begin to reunite them, but also without losing what's been gained from the separation? What are some of the things that have been gained from the separation? There's a recognition of our autonomy as individuals, as human beings. There's a a valuation of individual human rights, for example, that make possible a recognition of really that that make possible things like feminism or overturning racism, all of these very important social developments that can only arise from evaluation of the individual. So there is something that has been gained and there's something that's been lost. And now how do we continue to move forward both Weaving back in what has been lost and also holding what we've gained. And in that bringing back together, of course, something else inevitably will be lost. And, and that is, that is the way of, that is the way of the world. That is the way of how consciousness, how paradigms evolve. There is always a loss as well as a gain. And I feel like it's becoming especially clear just in these last couple months since since the coronavirus came around that as we see the collapse of systems, as we see all of the injustices in a new light, that we are at one of those pivotal moments where we can start to see through our states of consciousness, our ways of being, and ask, you know, what what comes next? And I think you're very right in that, you know, logic is important. Rationality is important. Reason is so important. What is necessary is to balance them with imagination, with emotion, with embodiment, not to just flip the hierarchy, not to throw out our mental capacities, our intellectual capacities, but how do we find a more harmonious balance? I think of what Gregory Bateson says, we need both rigor and imagination. Very, very good. (laughs) I was thinking too, during this, how Tolkien talks about fantasy being used for bad purposes as well. And I think in the modern world, hopefully people have become aware of the fact that what's coming to them through the TV is a type of dark fantasy a lot of the time. And that this sort of global brotherhood of man openness to strangers that many of us have 
been, I think, taking for granted throughout our lifetimes, how we can meet someone we've never met before at a store or at the gym and strike up a conversation and find common ground immediately and have respect for one another and have certain types of social boundaries that are also in play for everybody that keep us all feeling both safe, but also able to communicate and connect with each other. How quickly that rug has been pulled out from under us with the current situation, how easily we could not only lose the the good things that we've gained, but bring back bad things that we've thought we'd gotten rid of, like xenophobia, for example. I think there, there's a real there's a real possibility for humanity to go back into possibly just as bad of a a state of division as the dark ages, as it were. <laughs> it's a great place to to wrap things up here. Uh, it's been as fun as ever to talk with you and I want to make sure and give you plenty of time to close off any loose ideas that are still floating around in your head. And of course, tell people about what they can do with you as far as uh, working virtually, because luckily you're able to provide services for people in this time without having to uh, break quarantine as it were. And uh, make sure, and I want you to make sure and give uh, as full a representation of your services and offerings as you can so that people know what they can uh, can do to further that personal hero's journey by working with you. Mm. Oh, thank you. Well, just to, to loop back to your point that we, we are kind of at that moment when Frodo and Sam are on the edge of Mordor and that they're in the middle of the story and we're very much in the middle of the story and how do we want our story to be told? Maybe that's part of how we can think of how we're living through this time. Each choice we make, how do we have that weave into the story of our lives and how we showed up at this moment of the time of the great unraveling, at the time of the great turning, as Joanna Macy also calls it. The way that people can work with me is... I I am an archetypal astrologer. So my primary work is doing astrology readings and pretty much everything I do is accessible through my website, which is just my name, beccatarnas.com. Although I have a, I do have a separate astrology site that can be accessed through that, which is archetypalprism.com. Prism as in the, the crystal that refracts white light to, to the many colors. It's the great archetypal image. And I have a lot of different writings up there on my website, Uh, many, many essays that I've written over the years and uh, podcasts and links to my book, the book that you mentioned, Journey to the Imaginal Realm. And I've edited a a couple books as well. Um, It's part of the Archi uh, Journal of Archetypal Cosmology series. I'm one of the the co-editors on that project. And a couple months ago, the issue seven came out, which I was the the editor of. So that's all looking at you know, archetypal cosmology, which is a discipline that includes astrology and the philosophy, psychology, spirituality that kind of stands behind the question of why does astrology work? What are archetypes exploring those ideas? What does it tell us about our cosmos that there are significant archetypal correlations between the movement of the planets and what's happening here in our own human lives. So that's some of the work that I do. I've I've started offering since the pandemic began, I started offering monthly astrological forecasts uh, that happen just before the new moon. And all of that can be again, found on my website, beccatarnas.com. Very good. And that's no small amount of work either that you're describing, either the editing or the the writing. And I think that that archetypal view of the cosmos is one of the most powerful because it's the type of perspective that points the that looks into the mirror and sees that inner outer connection. Like you were saying that in and out are really <laughs> you're when you're going in, you're also going somewhere outward as well. It's uh the beautiful paradox, the beautiful mystery, the indescribable, ineffable, immaculate, infinite reality that we are 
really fortunate to exist within, I would say. Uh, I think that the further that you explore these ideas, the more empowering they become, the more we realize that our own likeness or we were created in the likeness or we exist in the likeness of the infinite of creation itself, that that is both our gift and our curse. If we fail to realize that we are wielding such a power, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very good. It's been an awesome conversation. I thank you for your, your time today. And I hope everyone does go check out other parts of your work, other podcasts you've been on and uh, thanks so much. It's been a blast. Thank you as well. It's so wonderful to get to explore Middle Earth and Tolkien's writings at such a deep level and just recognizing the infinite facets that can be explored there and how they open out onto so many important elements of the world. So thank you. Thank you for the the work that you do and everything that you're creating here, this uh, inner universe that you you open so many people up to. Oh, thanks for coming back so soon. It was definitely my honor and pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for making it to the end of another episode. And if you're going to hang out with me a little longer, I'd love to talk to you about some of the stuff that came up in this episode that I found interesting and I believe is worth further investigation, further thought. But most of all, I want to thank Becca for coming back so quickly and definitely want to have her back again sooner than later, because just like last time, I barely scratched the surface of my notes and just wound up talking about things that came up in the process of the conversation. And maybe I need to just do it myself, but I want to have a full on Lord of the Rings conversation someday down the road that covers lots of specific details from the story and just celebrates how cool it is and, you know, ponders what we can learn from all these various themes that come up in Tolkien's work. Hope you guys are as stoked as I am to be getting even more Tolkien talk right off of the back of the episode that came out previously with David Whitehead, where we talked about the heroic archetype, really cool stuff. And the idea of becoming the adult protector of your own inner child, that was probably the most useful thing that came up in the free version of the show, the first hour of the conversation. This makes a lot of sense to me, and it's something I have considered before, that the real meaning of personal responsibility and sovereignty is to treat your body and mind like a little child that you're raising with love and care, instead of as a meat robot that you can use and abuse. I am not perfect at this, actually far from it, but it is something to work on. I think that's what it really means to be a, an adept or an adult, I guess. <laughs> Adultism is a plague in the world right now. The self-murdering of the inner child, as I take that phrase to mean. Michael Tesserion has a lot of interesting work on that. And he's a podcaster that does a show called Unslaved, which I happen to be on recently, which is kind of amazing to me. It's one of my favorite shows and I was happy to be on that. I talked to them about occult symbolism in video games specifically and uh, some, some of the things about the psychology of the hardcore gamer, which I have got plenty of experience <laughs> and can talk about with validity for sure. But it's definitely a bit of a dream come true to actually be a guest on one of my favorite shows. So if you're interested in checking it out, go over to unslaved.com. You got to become a member actually to hear the podcast, which is a rare type of business model these days. But they talk about the kind of stuff that the powers that should not be really don't want you to think about. So in order to avoid the inevitable getting kicked off of YouTube and all that, they just forego the entire thing. And instead of trying to throw the most high level information at the widest range of people, they target the best people, the ones most interested in the subject, the ones that are going to be engaged with it because they had to pay for it. So I recommend paying for it. I've been a member of their a member of their uh, subscription model for a long time. I've probably checked out everything they've done. If you do check it out and think like, wow, this seems really different than how you seem in terms of the uh, attitudes that they've got going on in their podcast, it's just like anything else. I don't take what one person 
or any person says is 100% correct. I am my own person. So I do think Unslaved overall has been a huge benefit on my life, even if some people think <laughs> Michael is a crotchety guy. And maybe it's a bit justified to be crotchety, or maybe we need more righteous anger in our world. That is a component of every hero that they have to grapple with rage versus, I guess, righteous indignation. And that there are things in the world that are evil and they're worth being mad about. That's why we have the emotion and it is a way to energize our motivation to do something about it, not to be addicted to anger or to use it the way that the dark side of the force is used in, you know, Star Wars. But another thing you can hear on Unslaved that I think is really interesting is talk about the little people. Michael Tesserian has done a lot of research on that. And plus, Becca mentioned that Tolkien didn't like Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare because the fairies are so tiny. But I think there is something relevant in that description. Maybe not like the size of a thimble, like Tinkerbell, Peter Pan style. But I've brought up the show Hellier a bunch of times before. The diminutive goblin creatures that come out of caves in Kentucky. That research documentary, how interesting it is. There's plenty of historical information, not just about little people, but also about giants. And I think that our history is extremely occulted from us. It's very hidden. And that's part of maybe the losing of enchantment. But in the plus extension, I guess I'll tell you about that. You should subscribe to Interverse Plus on Patreon if you want to hear the second hour of the conversation. $5 a month gets you all the extended episodes and the huge archive of many excellent podcasts that have come before. And it's not that much money, $5 a month. I mean, there's got to be something that you could trade for that. Or maybe you have $5 extra. I think most people do. I sure could use the subscription from you and it's a win-win because you get all of the bonus content, but the plus extension this time around, we talked about Tolkien's critique on drama and how media creates illusory worlds that people inhabit the mythological misenchantment of malefic modern belief systems, the character Gollum aesthetic philosophy and the relation of beauty to goodness and ugliness to evil we talked about esoteric ideas in Tolkien's final tale, Smith of Wooten Major, the fairy queen at the heart of the imaginal realm that embodies nature herself or itself. Definitely like the ultimate goddess archetype. We talked about that. Dancing between bittersweet bereavement and mystical remembering. Very fun yin and yang type of dynamic that we started getting into in the middle, getting closer to the end of the plus extension. We also talked about parallels between Lord of the Rings and other Tolkien stories that are not set in Middle Earth. The understanding of Tolkien's elves as the mediators between spirit and matter. And at the end, we talked about Gandalf's wisest words of all, which many of you may remember from the films where he says, all that we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I love that quote. <laughs> what I've decided to do at the time that's given to me is be a podcast host for better or worse. <laughs> Definitely sometimes seems difficult to do that, juggling it with the uh, obligations I have to make money. So that's why I'd really like you to sign up for Plus and hear that Plus extension that I just detailed. There's a lot more in it besides the summary I just gave. Of course, I can't tell you all of it. Hope you do check it out. And also, like I already brought up, I hope you are able to get into the Unslaved episode that I was a guest on. Unfortunately, I won't be able to share it with you other than maybe some clips that I can grab from it and put up for my YouTube channel, but not the whole thing. And it's a really interesting topic because we were talking about Gnosticism. And a lot of you may already know what that concept is referring to. It's a big can of worms, but it's essentially the idea that our reality is somehow constructed by a demiurge that built this illusory world to contain and enslave the fragmented sparks of the divine pleroma or the universal consciousness of higher truth. And that we each are holding a, cut, a portion of that, a spark of that, and that we're meant to escape from this world in some way. And that this world is not our home. And this is a ubiquitous idea throughout most mainstream religions of the world in some way or another that we are in the world, but not of it. And I think that's a problem as far as why we've lost our enchantment with the earth and 
why we no longer f- deeply feel the innate significance of nature, why so many people think that life is meaningless, completely meaningless. And while it is true that we're each able to create meaning in our own lives however we want, and I used to even think this way that, that there was no inherent meaning in anything and it's just up to us to make it all, that's kind of solipsistic because there actually is some inherent significance to nature itself. There are things that fit into patterns. There are resonances at different octaves where one thing reflects another thing in a fractal way. And because of that, and because of the way that nature can make us all feel certain ways the same, I think that means that there is some kind of primary significance to nature. And maybe through the complex spell of language, that type of operating system, maybe that's where we lost our enchantment a little bit, where we started to process the world entirely through symbols and not through direct experiential perception. But I believe that this problem of the Gnostic gene that is embedded in all of our psyches, especially in our culture, I believe that problem fits into the idea of the fairy realm and how Tolkien basically said that fairy was like exactly the same as our world other than it was other than it was enchanted. What does it mean to be enchanted? We have to answer that for ourselves, but I think why I bring up this Gnostic thing is because I want to convey the idea and I'm going to work on conveying this idea in better and better ways going forward that this isn't a fallen world that we inhabit. We are the fallen ones. <laughs> I mean, we've fallen not from some higher spiritual state into matter and that matter is some type of illusion or death that we need to escape from. But I mean, we've fallen in our perception. We've fallen in our understanding. We've fallen in our wisdom. Our enchantment is what has fallen off. We are all emanations of a divine universal source consciousness. That is true. But we can be that and embody that without the belief that somehow being in a body separates us from it. And with the mainstream religions, especially, but also just the way a lot of people live in Western culture and in other cultures around the world, not all of them, there's a real loss of connection to the body. There's the seeing the body as like something low and base and not spiritual, not part of the real higher truth or the ultimate reality that these bodies are somehow just vehicles or meat robots, like I said, to be used and discarded. Same with the earth, that this is a simulation. So it doesn't matter if we destroy the earth or any of these ideas that give us a sense of separation from our environment, but especially from our physical form. I think that our physical form is our spirit. I do not think that there's a separation. Yes, your spirit may be a seed or the seed inside of you, the spark inside of you. But think of the idea of a spark. Whenever a spark catches something on fire, the spark is gone, but the flame is there. And your body is like that flame that came from the spark of your spirit, your shard of the divine consciousness. Not even the shard. It is the whole thing. It's a fractal. It represents the whole thing. You are the whole. Your body is the whole. This relates to the as above, so below etheric pathways that I talked about with Michael Wan to go with the seed metaphor. Whenever a seed, a seed grows into a tree, it is no longer there. The seed is gone, but it is, it is contained within the tree. The tree can even create new seeds that are a, a, some more or less a copy of it, but not a total copy. There's always variation. There's always a progressive evolution. And that, that is what we're here for. We're here for, we're here to use our capacity, our divine capacity to take the perfection of nature and make it just a little bit more perfect. Find that way to do that. That's the art. That is sub-creation that Tolkien talks about. <laughs> Getting deep. <laughs> Hope you guys like it. I'm glad that you even are listening to the outro. I sometimes skip the outros of shows that I even love a lot. So <laughs> glad you're not doing that. Thanks for listening and hearing me out. I'm going to play us off with 
a track by My Own Eyes from his Emanation EP that he released back in March. You may recognize the name My Own Eyes because I've played him before more than once. I tend to play the same musical artists a lot. A, because they're awesome. B, because they're friends of mine. And C, because they make new music regularly. And D, I can play that music without copyright consequences. So, that being said, I wouldn't mind changing it up and finding some new stuff. My search for new music is kind of fallen by the wayside because I'm spoiled with knowing a lot of good musicians and because I'm a little busy and I don't like just go looking for new music as often as I should. I still listen to new music. I think it's important to hear new music regularly to expand your mind and, you know, rewrite the boundaries of your mental map in a sense. But I'm asking if you make music and I could play that music on my show without getting into copyright strikes on YouTube and Spotify, send me those beats, yo. Chance at interversepodcast.com is my email. You can also just message me on SoundCloud or any social media. Show me what you're making. I'd love to hear it. I could play it on the show if it's fitting or if you really want to hit a home run <laughs> and I might find some way to reward you for this or like, I mean, get in touch with me. I could pay for it even. Uh, I want to get some original interverse music. I love the intro theme that I've got, but who knows? Maybe we could replace that. It upgrade that maybe not upgrade it's good how it is i really love it but it's been a couple of years since i started using it it wouldn't be a bad idea to switch it up so if you want to get in on that or at the very least just want to show off your tunes on the show at the outros send me that music chance at interversepodcast.com and uh, thanks for listening i love you much it's great that we can connect this way hope you're feeling good hope you're getting all the things (laughs) done that you want to get done and relaxing enough. And unlike me, hopefully you're uh, getting enough exercise. I've kind of really slacked off on that since the gym's all closed, but looks like that's about to maybe at least temporarily ease up a little bit. Wouldn't be surprised if there's a second wave of panic about the uh, so-called virus, but we'll talk about it later and I'm going to get out of here, make myself some, Veggie rice burrito. I think that's what I want to make for dinner. You don't need to know that, but yeah, my own eyes, M I O W I N I Z E. That's what I'm going to play you out with. That's linked in the show notes. And oh man, of course, don't forget also in the show notes are Becca's links where you can get in touch with her for archetypal astrology or check out her book or her website. All the many things that she does creatively. What a good person. What an awesome friend we've gained with becca really glad that she's part of the interverse uh roster (laughs) that's the word but all right let's get out of here don't forget to check out my own eyes 